Hello everyone, today is a very good day and a good evening, which means it's time for Sam's Legal Talk. So welcome back to Legal Space 101, the podcast where we dive deep into legal matter and explore the evaluations of the legal systems. I'm your host in time today. We have an intriguing discussion ahead. We'll be exploring the historical roots of the equity, the famous statement by John Sheldon, and the relevance in our modern legal landscape. So before we dive into the topic, let's get to know our guests for a little better. Could you guys please introduce yourself for our audience and listeners? Hello, I am Muhammad Afish Hayran. Uh, I am from Bangi. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Good day, listeners. My name is Lakshmi Sokumar and I'm thrilled to be here today. A big shout out to Ms. Intan. Thank you for having me. I'm a lawyer and I'm from Raman Partners Firm and I've been practicing accident claim cases for 10 years. I hope my insights add value to our discussion today. Thank you, Ms. Intan, for inviting me here. So I'm Sam Afad, one of the legal advisors for Law Office and Property Sendirian Bahad. Hello everybody, my name is Nafrai Nabila uh, and we hope uh, for our presence today uh, we will give a valuable insights on today's topic. Fantastic! Now we already made our experts, let's dive into the meat of today's discussion. So in our first segment, we'll talk about the historical background. So my uh, first question to Mr Afik is that um, the historical background of John Sheldon's statement um, bring forth the intriguing analogy of the Chancellor's marriage with equity, right? So how does he criticize the relationship between the Chancellor and the equity? And what criticism does he arise regarding the authority for a Chancellor in enacting and enforcing the law? Thank you, Intan, for giving me the opportunity to talk today. So. Basically, on today's podcast, we are delving into the fascinating world of English legal history, uh, exploring the intricate relationship between the Chancellor, equity, and common law, as discussed by John, Sand John Selden in his table talk uh, from the, the year 1689. Selden actually paints a vivid picture of a peculiar marriage between the Chancellor and equity, casting them as a dominant husband and a sensitive wife. Selden applauds the Chancellor for his ability to provide unique solutions throughout uh, equitable doctrines, essentially rendering decisions on his own terms. However, this autonomy has raised eyebrows with critics arguing that chancellors may be overstepping their authority by enacting and enforcing laws simultaneously. And also Selden perhaps uh, unintentionally points out a shared flaw in both common law and equity. So the potential ramific ramification of this legal dynamic, including the questions of le legitimacy and uh, authority, are significant. So Selden, uh, it seems that, uh, did not fully explore the consequences uh, of the statements, opening up discussions about the flaws within the English legal system. Join us as we unravel the complexities of this historical legal marriage and its implication for the authority of the law. So that's for the first question that you are asking. Okay, so Mr. Afik, how did the uh, the reliance on the consigned shape, the discretionary nature of equity? And uh, actually, I want to know what impact that it has. Uh, it um, what impact that it have on the decision making a process in the court of chancery during the john sheldon's era yeah all right certainly thank you intan so the next one we are diving into the integral realm of legal philosophy which is specifically exploring the role of conscience in equity as discussed by john sheldon which is the conscience a timeless principle in jurisprudence has been a cornerstone of fair legal practices for centuries in the early courts of chancery conscience was a guiding force which is uh, serving to mitigate the sometimes harsh consequences of common law. Um, this discretion heavily reliant on conscience was a defining characteristic of what Kling describes as the hallmark of the medieval chancery. The era is often metaphorically encapsulated uh, phrases like the chancellor's foot. So as we journey back to the time of the chancellor and the court of chancery, we uncover how conscience played a pivotal role in the decision making process. In this era, each case was uniquely decided based on the Chancellor's conscience, highlighting the discretionary nature of equity. So, we unravel the historical tapestry of legal thought and explore how conscience shaped the nuanced landscape of equitable jurisprudence. So, that's all from me. Thank you, Intan. So, we'll, move, we'll be moving on. Thank you, Mr. Afik, for sharing line on the historical background of equity and role of a conscience during John Sheldon's time. 
Thank you so much. Okay, moving on to our second segment, the applicability of John Selden's statement in the modern era and the equitable remedy. So, Ms. Lashanya, I read your journals about the argument that the discretionary nature of uh, equity, as highlighted by uh, Selden's, is no longer uh, relevant today. So, Ms. Lashanya, can you light uh, on how the modern legal system, with it emphasized on the precedence, has restricted the discretionary roles of equity? Yes. To answer your question, Ms. Intan, firstly, the modern legal system that is based on court precedence has its roots in the doctrine of stare decisis. This doctrine binds the courts, especially lower courts, to past precedence of higher courts, which are strictly and consistently followed by judges. Thus, in the modern legal system today, judges cannot completely rely on their conscience or have the discretionary power that the chancellor used to have, as they are bound by precedence and court hierarchy. The system of court precedence restricts the discretionary nature of equity. In the 1948 English case of Ministry of Health and Simpson, the English Court of Appeal decided that for a claim of equity to succeed, it must be founded on court precedence, rather than being founded on requiring justice. As such, in the legal system today, judges are not allowed to deliver judgments fully based on their conscience, but based on legal precedence. In context of equitable remedies, right, uh, particularly in uh, Athen Pillar order, what criteria must be fulfilled for a judge to grant order? And how does it affect the discretionary natures of quality in this election? Yeah. So, first and foremost, for our listeners' information, the Anton Pillar order is from the 1976 English case of Anton Pillar KG and Manufacturing Processes Limited and others. This uh, Anton Pillar order allows the civil search and inspection of the defendant's premises and documents to prevent the destruction or concealment of evidence by the defendant. The criteria that a judge must fulfill to grant this order is to firstly consider whether there's a strong prima facie case, and secondly, whether there is clear evidence that the defendants in fact possess incriminating documents. And lastly, whether there's a possibility that the documents could be destroyed before the application is made. Thus, such criteria required by this equitable remedy removes the discretionary nature of equity and binds the courts and judges. I hope that has answered your question, Ms. Vintan. So, moving on to the last segment, which is the equitable maxim. Um, this question I will uh, ask Ms. Farah. So, how does the maxims of equity follow the law impact the discretionary natures of equity? And can you provide some example that can illustrate how equity uh, intervene while adhering to establish your legal principles? Yes, I would gladly answer this. So, the maxim equity follows the law is like a guiding star for equity. It doesn't seek to overthrow established legal principles, but rather to enhance them. As Cardozo CJ has highlighted in the case of Graf and Hope Building Corporation, it's about elevating the law and not replacing it. But how does this impact equity's discretionary nature? Consider this scenario. In the case of Sticklin and Aldridge, under the common law, the eldest son was entitled to the entire estate, sidelining the younger siblings. Now, while this might seem harsh, it was legally acceptable. But equity would have intervened if the son had influenced his father not to make a will promising to share the estate. This prevents unfairness by nullifying an advantage gained to a legal estate due to a promise. So, as you can see, equity steps in not to contradict the law, but to mitigate its harshness or even to prevent abuse. Now, the beauty lies in how um, equity's intervention aligns with established legal principles. Take John Selden's statement on variability. John Selden has implied that equity might introduce variability, but cases like Graf and Stickland demonstrate otherwise. So, equity follows the law not to introduce variability, but to maintain its fidelity. It ensures a harmonious synergy between legal principles and fairness, safeguarding the foundational integrity of our legal system. Okay, as far as I know, uh, the maxim delay defeat equity shape the latest doctrine. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, I want to ask, in what way does the timelines of pursuing a legal remedy impact the court decision to grant uh, equitable relief? Ms. Farah, can you answer this? Now, the maxim delay defeats equity forms the bedrock of the Lashes Doctrine, proclaiming that a party who has delayed seeking equitable remedies may be barred from obtaining them. 
So this is a reminder that procrastination in seeking recourse can weaken or nullify one's claim for equitable relief. Now here's the twist. This concept doesn't apply when statutory limitations are in play. Statutes of limitations take precedence, directly or indirectly, over equitable jurisdiction. They dictate whether a claim was filed within the prescribed time frame, superseding equitable considerations. Now let's consider the case of Smith & Clay. This case vividly illustrates how the timeliness of pursuing legal remedies can heavily sway a court's decision in granting equitable relief. Delays in initiating legal action significantly impact the court's evaluation, as equity remains sensitive to any delay that undermines fairness or thwarts the intended remedy. And then, there's the case of Lindsay's Petroleum Company and Hurt. Picture this. A contractual dispute, brewing, a breach identified, but a delay in filing a lawsuit against Lindsay Petroleum. This case demonstrates how the court's determination of equitable remedies can be influenced by delays following a breach. And equity stresses the vital link between timeliness and the fairness of remedies favoring prompt legal action. What's intriguing here is how this principle of delay defeats equity contradicts John Selden's theory. So Selden has suggested that equity's variability akin to the Chancellor's discretion, however the doctrine of lashes, encapsulated in this maxim, opposes such variability. It prevents parties from seeking equitable remedies if they have unjustifiably postponed legal action, prioritizing fairness in seeking remedies. So, as exemplified by these cases, this maxim shines a spotlight on the critical role of timeliness in equitable remedies. Okay, uh, my next question is about the maxim, which is uh, he who uh, seeks equity must do equity. Um, this maxim impacts the granting of equitable remedy, right? So, what role does this maxim play when the legal precedents are insufficient or absent? Mr. Sam, can you answer this question? That's a very good question, um, Michelle. So, picture this. A plaintiff seeking equitable relief, the maxim, he who seeks equity must do equity, serves as a pivotal guide. It asserts that for a plaintiff to obtain equitable remedies, they must be willing to act justly towards the defendant. It's about fairness and honestly in the pursuit of justice. Now, let's dive into the legal landscape. Huh? Equitable remedies, discretionary in nature hinge not just on the plaintiff's establishment of an equitable right but also on their deserving nature. Okay, A plaintiff, when seeking equity, must be prepared to treat the defendant with reasonableness and uh, justice. Consider the case of uh, Damari and Metcalf, where legal precedents were lacking in this scenario. The court turned to the maxim, he who seeks equity must do equity, as a guiding um, principle. The judgment mandated the executor to fulfill the obligation owed to the defendant, emphasizing the necessity for equitable conduct. Despite the absence of direct legal guidelines, the court anchored its decision in the principles encapsulated by this maxim. So, um, we can see in the case of, there's another case, uh, which is the Chapel and Times Newspaper Limited. We witnessed this maxim in action again. So, like, despite Chapel's assertion that the information was public knowledge, the court found his actions unjust. Chappell had breached his obligation of confidentiality to his previous employer. So the court invoking the maxim restrained Chappell from using or disclosing proprietary information. So this case, um, th those both cases illustrate a stark contrast to John Selden's uh, theory of equity's variability. Instead, they exemplify mm -hmm. the consistent application of the maxim, he who seeks equity must do equity. Uh, they also show how equitable principles are upheld, demanding fairness and reasonable, reasonable, reasonableness from parties seeking relief, even in varied uh, circumstances. So, um, what about Maxim, uh, equity shall not suffer a wrong without a remedy, shape the principles of equity jurisdictions. Mr. Sams, um, how the Equity addresses the violations violations of fundamental rights. Mr. Sims, can you explain more about this? Okay, right. So the maxim, um, from your question, right, from from your second question, so the maxim boldly asserts that where the common law fails to rectify a wrong, equity steps in to ensure justice prevails. It forms the cornerstone of equity jurisdiction, dictating that no injustice should go unaddressed if the court possesses the means to correct it. Okay, the case of Ashby against White. So a powerful illustration of this principle in action. Here, the violation of the plaintiff's fundamental right to vote prompted the court to grant the plaintiff a remedy. 
So despite the absence of quantifiable damages, the court recognized the inherent value of defending individual liberties and rectifying wrongs, even when the immediate consequences on an election outcome were marginal. So this case underscores equity court's belief. Justice extends beyond more mere compensation for losses. It encompasses um, the defense of rights, prevention of unfair gains, and accountability, respective of uh, immediate outcomes in specific situations. So, like, uh, moreover, um, let's delve into Sears, Roebuck, and Co. against Camp. Here, uh, Justice Herher highlight um, equity's adaptable nature, stressing that equitable remedies are constrained by strict rules but are rather tailored to suit the unique circumstances of each case. This adaptability empowers equity to address complex issues where legal remedies may fall short. So however, the saying equity varies with the length of Chancellor's foot introduces a potential contradiction. It implies a subjective aspect to equity, hinting at the possibility of diverse interpretation and outcome depending on the judge. This complexity highlights the, the challenge of maintaining consistency while navigating the subjective nature of equitable principles. So as we witnessed through Ashby and White, and Sears, Roebuck, and Co. and Camp, the maximum equity shall not suffer a wrong without remedy, stands firm, it, which it aligns with the pursuit of justice, but also highlights the difficulty in balancing consistent application of equitable principles with the inherent uh, subjectivity in their interpretation. So that's all for me. And my last question from uh, this Maxims, equitability Maxims, uh, Ms. Farah, can the maxim equity look to intent rather than form play a crucial role in court decision? And what impact does it have on court approach to contract or particularly in a land sale agreement? Can you explain this part? Now, this maxim serves as a guiding light in court cases, particularly those involving equity. It directs the court to prioritize the true essence or purpose behind a situation over its outward appearance or technicalities. By focusing on the broader context and motivations involved, this approach ensures equitable decisions grounded in substance rather than mere formalities. So let's unravel this through the case of Parkin and Thorold. So here in this case, Lord Romley MR has acknowledged the maxim, equity looks to intent rather than form, in an appeal regarding a land sale contract. The court has ruled that the specified time for completion wasn't crucial, unless either party insisted on adhering strictly to the contract's time frame. So this case has illustrated how court lean on this maxim, elevating the substance of a case above rigid technicalities. And the decision in this case highlights the significance of prioritizing intent over contractual provisions, showcasing how this principle influences land sale agreements. So, a similar resonance can be found in the case of Urban One, Block Street Limited and Ayers, further emphasizing that the court's reliance on established principles and equitable considerations. This consistency mirrors the application uh, of the maxim in Parkin and Thorold, underscoring the court's inclination to give weight to intent over strict formalities in contract disputes. This instance contradicts Selden's argument which emphasizes the significance of equitable principles and also the precedence over the subjective conscience of judges in legal decisions instead this case is reaffirm the court's commitment to equitable considerations, demonstrating a preference for the underlying intent over contractual technicalities. So as exemplified by these cases, this maxim significantly influences court decisions, particularly in land sale agreements. It's a beacon guiding courts toward fair and equitable resolutions rooted in the true essence of a matter. Thank you, Ms. Farah Nabila and Mr. Sam Ahmad for the wonderful explanations about the maxims that related to equity. Okay, anyway, that concludes our in-depth explorations of equity, John Sheldon's statements and their relevance in modern legal systems. A big thank you to our esteemed guests, Ms. Afik, uh, Ms. Lakshanya, Mr. Sam Ahmad and Ms. Farah Nabila for sharing your valuable insight. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us on Legal Space One-on-One. -on -one. So those who didn't subscribe yet our channel please do subscribe share and turn on notification bell so if you have any questions or topic that you would like to us to cover in a future episode feel free to reach out until next time stay informed and empowered bye, -bye. <laughs>